Well, welcome everyone. Um, good morning. Um, welcome to MBCA's 2021 annual meeting and a presentation by Anne-Marie Eldering of the JPL uh, Laboratory. Um, we are pleased to have you here this morning. I'm Lorraine Turk, MBCA's secretary. Uh, we certainly wish we could all meet in person, but we are so glad to have you with us. Uh, this is our first public uh, Zoom meeting. We have been having our board meetings with Zoom, but um, please bear with us if in our first effort there are a few uh, slowdowns or glitches or uh, uh, little problems, but we're, we will work through them. I want to especially thank Amy Bouye, who is our technical uh, advisor today and making a lot of this happen, um, and also helping out if uh, some of you might have any technical uh, problems, you can put them into the chat and we will try to help you out. Um, we are going to use the chat feature for questions, um, but they will, be mod uh, they will be viewed by the moderators. And uh, if you do have questions, go ahead and type them in and we will either get back to you personally by typing something in if it's a problem, or uh, we will be doing the question and answer at the, uh, after Anne-Marie's presentation. Our plan for the meeting is about an hour and a half. Uh, we'll begin with a blessing. Um, and we will have the Steve Bardwell's presidential presentation on the year for MBCA and our issues, and then to Anne-Marie's presentation and questions. So now to start us off in a respectful recognition of the lands and the people who came before us in the Morongo Basin and the desert, we will have a blessing from Michael Madrigal of the Native American Lands Conservancy. Mihuan Neneteo Mike Madrigal, Kawinga. Good morning. Hello, everyone. I'm um, Michael Madrigal. I'm uh, a member of the Native American Land Conservancy and of the Kawia Band of Indians. It's an honor to be here with all of you today. And uh, we'll take a few moments uh, for prayer and reflection. And uh, so I'll begin <clears throat> first by acknowledging. Um, our ancestors, the spirits of the land, um, our mother, the earth, Chemtemo, and uh, the peoples who have lived and cared for this place for countless generations. So I do ask permission of my elders and of the people of the Nuwuvi, Moranga, and Iviatum peoples, the uh, Chemawevi, Serrano, and Kawia peoples who've lived in this area for so many generations also ask permission of our beautiful Mother Earth, uh, the plants, the animals, the air, the uh, fire, the winds, the spirits of this place. And that is um, our first, uh, our first uh, attention today. And each of us can pray in our own way. Uh, in our Kawia way, we use feathers to help carry our prayers to Creator. We use sage to help purify and clear the way for our prayers. We use tobacco to offer healing medicine for all that are in need. And uh, of course, today we also will ask for special healing for all who are suffering in the pandemic. We pray for the families and relatives that are sick. We pray for those who have uh, passed on to the spirit world. As many of you know, there's been a great deal of sickness and death among the Native American people in particular. Uh, most of our tribal communities are mourning the loss of multiple members and uh, it is a very difficult, painful time for our entire world. And so we ask for healing, strength, peace, and comfort. Uh, we ask that um, we will be guided in a good way to overcome the, the present uh, challenges. O great loving creator, we ask you to help us to be good to one another. We ask you to guide us in our steps that we will always be loving and respectful. We ask you to help us to be clear in our thoughts 
and clear and open in our hearts that we will always be um, considerate of those to come, our, our children and the coming generations that we will always consider their uh, benefit as we make decisions today. We ask you to help us to know, to appreciate and love our beautiful Mother Earth who sustains us, who gives us all that we need for our physical well being. We ask you to help us to always be uh, aware of the spirits that are in the earth and around us that uh, we share in as your children, as human beings. Nesson Atrama, we say thank you so much, O love and creator. We ask you to unite us and keep us in good relations at all times. And we say, uh, we thank you and we love you. Nesson Atrama, Nashun Lovik, Metwedetne Aiwa, He, Aho, Amen. So may it be this way. May we always be centered in your love and care, O oh great creator. And uh, so thank you again for allowing me to join in the meeting. I know many of you and it's an honor to be here. Uh, I appreciate the work that you all are doing and may we always continue to work together to, um, to honor and to protect the beautiful landscape that sustains us here in this region. And so uh, I look forward to uh, hearing more and uh, participating in as much of the meeting as I can. So I'll stay with you as long as I can. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Michael, for that, uh, for that blessing. It is very special to have you here today. Really, really appreciate it so much. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the directors, members, and supporters of the Morongo Basin Conservation, or as we are known acronymically, MBCA, I am pleased to have you all in attendance today as we commence MBCA's 53rd year of, of advocacy for the healthy desert. In spite of, or perhaps because of the restri restrictions we have been forced to accept due to the ongoing pandemic, it was a very busy year for MBCA last year, and this coming year looks to be more of the same. MBCA is a volunteer run organization that lays claim to the oldest conservation association in the Morongo Basin. With that, I am pleased to introduce our 2021 officers and members of our board who contribute so much of their time and energy in support of our mission. In past years, we would have asked each director to stand so they could be acknowledged, but this year we will have to settle for each to wave and perhaps give a shout out uh, to their camera. First of all, our vice president, David Fick. Hello everyone. Our treasurer, Kathy Zarikoff. Hi everybody. Our secretary, Lorraine Turk. Hello again. Our past president, Sarah Kennington. Hello. And our directors, uh, uh, Meg Foley. Good morning. Pat Flanagan. Good morning, everybody. Brian Hammer. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. <laughs> Janet Johnston. Hi, thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Lipsitz. Morning, hi. Arch McCullough. Good morning, everybody. And Ruth Riemann. Hi, Ruth, we're, we're thinking of you. At this time, I would like to offer a special note of appreciation to Marina West, who is retiring from the board after serving for many years as secretary and treasurer. We will miss Marina's insight and intelligence and wish her the best. 
Marina, as past treasurer, has generously offered to assist our new treasurer, Kathy Zarikoff, with her duties as treasurer. Thank you so very much, Marina. The pandemic has required many changes in the way we all interact, not least the elimination of in-person meetings. Our regular monthly board meetings are now being held via Zoom. And while we miss seeing each other in person, our virtual meetings have presented the opportunity for attendance by many more guests. With the geography of the Morongo Basin covering such a wide area, the use of virtual meetings has drastically reduced the carbon footprint of directors who, are no, longer, who no longer must drive to our meetings. I encourage you all to attend our board meetings that are held on the second Thursday of each month from five o'clock to seven o'clock with the exception of the month of August where we hold a yearly board retreat. Please visit mbconservation.org to make a reservation to attend. We look forward to hearing from hearing your voice in support of our mission, which is to advocate for the healthy desert environment that nurtures the region's rural character, cultural wealth, and economic well-being. This mission casts a broad net, and our participation is evidenced in over 20 letters that we have either originated or signed onto within the last year. I encourage you to visit our website, mbconservation.org, to read letters on a wide variety of topics, ranging from environmental, and social justice, conservation, and wildlife protections, as well as local land use issues. These letters are well-researched, comprehensive in their analyses, and serve to educate and inform our members and decision makers. In 2016, MBCA helped to facilitate and participated in a gathering of Native American tribes at the Oasis of Mara in 29 Palms to celebrate the historical salt song ceremonies. We assisted in the publication of a book commemorate, commemorating the event where Puha sits, Salt Songs, Power, and the Oasis of Mara. This last year, MBCA pledged financial and organizational support for a pending grant application by the Native American Land Conservancy that would facilitate another gathering of tribes. We are awaiting word of the status of the grant and are hopeful that such a gathering will be forthcoming very soon. This last year saw the adoption of the San Bernardino Countywide Plan. MBCA was very active and involved in commenting upon this new countywide plan that replaces the 2007 County General Plan. This countywide plan represents many years of work culminating in a forward thinking, entirely web based plan. While we support the adoption of this technology, we were strongly opposed to the complete elimination of the legally binding. 14 community plans throughout the unincorporated portions of San Bernardino County. The 14 community plans had been housed within the development code, a code that must now be amended to comport with the new countywide plan. The repealed community plans are being replaced with community action guides, or by the acronym CAGs that are to be, quote, recognized, unquote, by the county. It is the intention of the county to place responsibility for defining and implementing the visions and goals of communities with the communities themselves. This responsibility will now require the involvement and active participation of community members and then rely on the county to respect the decisions and wishes of the communities, rather than statutory plans that were within the development code. I wish to point out that of the five county supervisors, it was our supervisor, Don Rao, 
whose district includes six communities that had their community plans repealed, was the only vote against their repeal. Community members will now have to roll up their sleeves and get to work to create and advocate for the communities they envision. MBCA board members have agreed to prepare a document that will address the deficiencies in the overly broad policies within this new countywide plan as they apply to the community of Joshua Tree. Over the course of MBCA's involvement with the countywide plan, we were reminded that ultimately land use issues are citizen enforced. We will continue to monitor and comment upon developments and proposals that would affect our desert communities. The countywide plan is structured around a series of elements that address, among other things, housing. The housing element of the plan must, by law, be updated every eight years, and 2021 is the year. With the profusion of short-term rentals in the desert, at the housing shortage is hitting the Morongo Basin particularly hard. Families in need of housing are being directed to areas as far away as needles to find accommodations. NBC will NBCA will track the housing element update and we will do our best to keep our members and supporters informed. NBCA was an active participant during the consideration by the California Fish and Game Commission of the petition for the Joshua tree, Yucca brevifolia, for candidacy as threatened under the California Endangered Species Act. The candidacy was granted in a series of regulations allowing incidental take, otherwise known as killing, known by the code section 2084 of Joshua trees. These were granted. An application for a permit to remove or trim a Joshua tree on a parcel for the purposes of safety must now be processed through the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Regulations pertaining to removal or transplanting of Joshua trees within the unincorporated portions of San Bernardino County, the town of Yucca Valley and the city of Palmdale are now dependent upon local regulations being crafted to protect Joshua trees. MBCA will monitor the progress of these regulations and keep our members apprised. During the course of the hearings, it was emphasized that Joshua trees are but only a small part, or only but a part of our desert ecosystem. And while the iconic lone Joshua tree is a compelling image, the recruitment of younger trees can only be assured if an intact ecosystem is there for support. A single lone tree within an otherwise paved area will not support future reproduction of the tree. Over the past year, MBCA has continued to track the many utility scale renewable energy developments proposed for our desert regions. Many of our comments and objections focused on the adverse effects uh, on air quality, environment, environmental justice, and the fragmentation and loss of habitat. These concerns, as well as, as the use of our most precious and diminishing resource, water, must be considered and their importance recognized in the consideration um, uh, of the imperative to transition from carbon-based fuels to clean, green, renewable energy. As of this week, MBCA is exploring the preparation of an analysis and inventory of all solar projects existing and proposed throughout the California and Western part of Nevada desert and their potential demand and effect on the limited water supplies available. This will prove to be, a, should we be able to perform this, uh, complete this, should prove to be very informative. We believe that with the urgency of addressing climate change becoming ever more urgent, we must not sacrifice the intact desert ecosystem for the benefit of renewable energy generated far from its ultimate point of use. MBCA continues to advocate for distributed solar generation on rooftops and in the built environment. 
Solar Valley is an initiative being conceived by the University of California Riverside's Center for Environmental Research and Technology, UCR CERT, and the counties of Riverside and San Bernardino that would cap that, that hope to capitalize on the res on our resource of abundant sunshine to electrify the inland empire empire. An upcoming seminar sponsored by UCR CERT will address the creation of Solar Valley and how it would relate to the new administration's plans to address climate change. The Solar Valley Initiative would incorporate utility scale renewables generated on desert lands. To that end, we are keeping a close watch on the proposed solar developments in the Lucerne Valley area that would all rely upon the calcite substation. Should that substation be constructed, the floodgates would open for carpeting the desert north of Lucerne Valley with utility scale solar developments. The free seminar is scheduled for February 11th. Please visit our website, mbconservation.org, to find a link to register. The recent publication of an amendment to the DRECP again focuses our efforts on the health of the desert. The deadline for submission of comments on this unneeded amendment is in April of this year. We will keep you informed as we further study this amendment. 2020 marked the 10th anniversary of our Desert Wise Living Landscape Tours. And while we were regretfully resorted to a virtual tour due to the pandemic, we were pleased to be able to offer a tour of five landscapes that incorporate water and energy-wise landscaping precepts. We were very pleased to present professional quality videos and are gratified to have seen them so well received. The initial videos available on our website have now been re-edited into a single video that captures the spirit and intent of our desert wise living and acknowledges the sponsorship of the local water districts and the Mojave Water Agency. For 2021, we have committed to a virtual desert wise living landscape tour. We are pleased, uh, we are pleased to have again received commitment and financial support from our sponsors. The tour will feature landscapes from all, all over the basin and within the different water districts. A takeaway from last year's tour for me was to always be aware of the source of the water that flows from my faucet. It is important to think about where that water originated, be it from an ancient aquifer that may be aquifer that may be an overdraft or groundwater that is being supplemented by water supplied by the state water project. Keeping in mind that water is finite and precious. This year marks the fifth year of the Ruth Dennison Environmental Scholarship. Given in honor of MBCA supporter and founder Ruth, uh, supporter Ruth Dennison, Ruth was the first Buddhist teacher in the United States to lead an all women's retreat for Buddhist meditation and instruction. Her center, the Dhammadena Desert Vipassana Center is located in Joshua Tree, California. This scholarship supports environmental education for local students who plan to attend a university or college and prepare for employment and careers related to environmental or conservation work. Applications will be available online and sent to high school counseling offices on February 1st. We look forward to receiving this year's applications. In 2020, MBCA increased our social media presence through Instagram and Facebook, thanks to the efforts of our social media persons, Stacy Doolittle and Amy Buya. We are so appreciative of their work uh, and glad to see our presence on the web expanded. 2021 promises to see more of MBCA in your inbox. Our annual meeting has historically been the time where we ask members to renew their memberships 
and when we encourage new members to join. So please take this opportunity to visit mbconservation.org and support MBCA. As you have just heard, there is no so many issues and causes that MBCA is tracking, and we count on support of our members and supporters to join the cause in advocacy for the desert. We are pleased to have received support and to have been able to collaborate with many other conservation organizations over the last year. I would like to call out just a few of them at this time. First, the Mojave Desert Land Trust. I see we have Susie Boyd here with us today. The National Parks Conservation Association, the Joshua Tree National Park Association, Basin and Range Watch, the Wildlands Conservancy, the California Desert Co Coalition, as well as more. Through the combined efforts of these organizations, we strive to make a distant difference and protect the desert environment. MBCA directors have been working with members of the third district dark sky committee in the crafting of a San Bernardino County lighting ordinance. As of yesterday, we have received word that a light trespass ordinance is on the agenda to be considered to be considered by the planning commission on Thursday, February 4th. This ordinate ordinance will mandate the use of fully shielded light fixtures of warmer colored temperature to prohibit the obnoxious, unhealthful, and dangerous lighting that obscures another of our precious resources, the stars above us. Following the commission vote this, the, uh, on the ordinance, it will then be considered by the Board of Supervisors. We are grateful for the support and efforts of our supervisors, past and present, and all dark sky advocates over the last nearly 12 years that have gotten us to this point. Today, I'm thinking of dark sky advocates that have passed on. Most recently, Andy Winger, former chief of code enforcement for the county, who was instrumental in crafting this ordinance. Also thinking of Basin residents and supporters, Victoria Fuller, and Mickey Luckman, who put so much effort into getting us to this point. And while we are speaking of stars above, at this time, I am very pleased to introduce our speaker for this morning, Dr. Anne-Marie Eldering, who will discuss carbon in our atmosphere. Anne-Marie, a graduate of Caltech with a doctorate in environmental, in environmental engineering science, and is with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is serving as the deputy project science scientist on the Orbiting Carbon Observatory located on the International Space Station. She is also the project scientist for the uh, Orbiting Carbon, Carbon Observatory number three that has been launched as a follow-on payload to the International Space Station. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. We look forward to hearing your uh, discussion about this this gas that's causing such problem here on our planet. Thanks so much, Anne-Marie. Excellent, thank you, Steve. And uh, hi, everyone. It's great to see all these faces. Good morning to everyone. I'm gonna share my screen here to uh, use a few slides to talk. So let's see if we can make this work. All right, cool. Okay, so I am, as Steve said, Anne-Marie Eldering, and uh, here to share a little bit about what we're up to um, on carboning, carbon cycle from space and the orbiting carbon observatories. Uh, so let me dive in, and what I'd like to do today is I'm going to kind of have three parts. I'm going to talk to you about just what is this gas and why does it matter, a little bit about what we're doing and how you measure it from space, and then I'll give you some of the results or what is it we found with what we're doing. Um, so this is me, as Steve mentioned, I serve on two different projects, Orbiting Carbon Observatory 3, which is on the space station, uh, went up there in 2019, and then OCO2, a free-flying satellite. And my job is to, to collect, direct and coordinate our teams to make sure we develop science data from this uh, measurement and we do things like calibrate it, do the math for the algorithm, validation. 
Uh, I've been at the Jet Propulsion Lab for over 20 years now, uh, working on different projects. So how did I end up doing this? Just a, a little bit about me. I grew up near Albany, New York. So this picture here on the left shows the Hudson River Valley, which is a, a, pretty much where I was a kid. I grew up in a rural area um, and train went by there, lots of cows, not so many people. So I was out in the environment a lot. My dad built a house, uh, he was an engineer. So I picked up some interest in engineering from him. And I can totally remember reading Ranger Rick magazine and thinking, wow, I wanna save all the critters in the world. Uh, so those are the kind of influences in my early life that led me to become an engineer. And then eventually, uh, out here to Southern California. So I don't know what brought the rest of you here or if you grew up here, but I came out for the smog. I know not a lot of people say that, but uh, 1988, I came out to Caltech and to study the smog of Los Angeles. It's a, a huge problem. Uh, we needed to learn more about what caused it, what creates it, and then try to work out how we might change things. So I studied smog and then developed ideas about what changes in transportation, shipping, household products, how could those influence and improve smog? So that brought me out here uh, and I've barely left since then. So let me dive in a little bit to greenhouse gases, uh, just because it's a term I'm going to use. You're probably familiar with this idea to just make sure we're all on the same base. You know that if you park your car in the sun, it can get really warm because that sunlight comes in through the glass it doesn't escape back out, the heat builds up and it becomes warm. The same principle for a greenhouse that you might use to grow vegetables. So that greenhouse gas applies to the earth. Our atmosphere is like that greenhouse effect blanketing us. And as you put more and more carbon dioxide is like building our blanket more and more and it traps more and more heat. So the greenhouse gases trap heat in the earth's atmosphere. We need some of them so we don't freeze to death but we only need a certain amount, otherwise we're gonna get quite warm. And carbon dioxide or CO2 is the most important of the gases that humans are releasing in terms of the overall effects of greenhouse gases. So that's why I wanna talk about carbon dioxide, particularly in what, uh, what we know and what we're learning about it. So this is a graph, I'm not gonna put too many graphs in front of you and I'm trying to limit my numbers, but just a couple things I wanna to try to have you remember. So this is a graph showing over the years since 1958 to 2020, how much carbon dioxide was measured in the atmosphere at Mauna Loa on, in Hawaii. Um, and you'll see two things that you'll wanna remember. Like if I look at the year I was born in 66, concentrations were about 320 parts per million. So a million molecules of air and 320 would be carbon dioxide. If we look at today, that number is up over 410. So there's been a big increase over time. That black line kind of shows the annual average and how it's increasing. And then you also see this kind of seesaw. The red line is the monthly data and it goes up and down and up and down and up and down. And I'll just take a minute to explain why that is and what's driving that. So the concentration's going up it's about 410 right now, and there's also a seasonality to it. So if you think about our atmosphere, the trees are actually really important to carbon dioxide and its changes. So in the springtime, when trees start growing, making leaves, they actually take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and uh, use it as their building material. We see that very strongly in the summer when the growth is quite high. So you'll see carbon dioxide in the atmosphere actually goes down a little every spring and summer as the plants are active. In the fall, the trees aren't growing, the leaves aren't uh, taking that CO2 out. It's either neutral or releasing a little bit back. And then in the winter, there's no more leaves as the decay process starts back up the leaves on the ground decay and put carbon dioxide back out. So a seesaw up and down is about the plant's role uh, in our carbon cycle. And just a couple other numbers. So if you think about how all of this plays together, humans are releasing carbon dioxide every year through burning of fossil fuels. Uh, we release about 10 gigatons of carbon each year. But the most important thing I want you to remember is about half of that staying in the atmosphere a quarter goes into the oceans and a quarter goes into these plants and the lands. 
So the oceans and the lands are helping us out a lot. They're slowing down how fast atmosphere grows because they take some of our carbon of that extra stuff we put up there out of the atmosphere. If we weren't here, the atmosphere, ocean, land, everything would stay in balance and, and the concentrations wouldn't change, but we're pumping up some extra stuff. They can't take it all out. So we do see growth over time. And then the scientists are trying to look at this because every year is a little bit different and we don't know some of the details. I said the land removes carbon dioxide, but which parts? Is it the tropical forest? Is it the trees in uh, the rock over the Rockies up in Canada? Is it uh, some other part of Eurasia? We're not quite sure about how much each area is doing and how that changes from year to year. Uh, so that's some of the things we'll want to figure out. So we understand the processes better and to try to understand what's going to happen down the road. Um, and just one more kind of sciencey figure. This is just showing how much carbon dioxide uh, humans emit. Again, from when I was born, it was about five gigatons per year, and now we're up over 10. So we're putting a lot more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But the blue bars are showing how much showed up and stayed in the atmosphere each year. And you can see Sometimes it wasn't that much and the ocean and the plants took a lot out. In other years, the ocean and the plants did not take much out. So why is that? We wanna understand why is it so variable and which part of the land and ocean is so important? And then how does that tie to other things like La Nina, El Nino, Enso cycles, other big kind of um, large scale variations. So that's kind of the heart of the science. Uh, how, why is this change from year to year? Which parts of the earth are so important? Okay, so that's kind of a little setting the stage of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere interactions and why we want to learn more. So now I'll take a minute to um, tell you about why we decided to use satellites to study this problem and then show you some of what we've learned. So this gorgeous figure is actually a model representation of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere. So colleagues over in the East Coast Goddard Space Flight Center ran this very detailed model. And uh, the bluer, greener colors are less carbon dioxide, the orange a little bit more, and the red is even more. So you can see uh, for this day in June, the Northern Hemisphere had more carbon dioxide, Southern Hemisphere has less. You see big gradients and features that look just like the weather patterns, right? There's transportation of, of carbon dioxide from one continent to another. It's swirling around through the weather systems. So they can model this and make some predictions of what it's gonna look like, but we need to really make the measurement and check. You know, carbon dioxide is dynamic, it changes with the seasons, but we were only seeing little hint of that picture. This is what January looked like. Here's what uh, March looks like. So you can see it's, it's a warmer, more concentration, but not a lot of detail. Uh, then you get to July, it looks quite different. So the ground-based view didn't really give us enough detail to put together the whole global picture. Uh, and we didn't see the oceans. So we had to just to take another approach and that's where satellites come into play. So this is an artist's rendition of our carbon dioxide measurement system. Uh, we're an instrument alone on a satellite. This piece is about the size of like a really big um, water heater or maybe a, a large refrigerator size, little solar panels. And it flies around and we measure a swath about 10 miles or 10 kilometers, six miles wide around Earth. Uh, so if you have that kind of measurement and we fly around the Earth about 16 times per day, over a month and a, or a week, you start to get a picture of what's happening all across the globe with carbon dioxide. So that's the idea of measuring it from space. We can see more of the globe. Uh, we can get pictures over the ocean, so this should help us understand the, the big picture and the, the way it's moving around. 
and uh, if you you know do this for a month, you start to get a big picture and the integrated view of the carbon dioxide around Earth. So measuring from space sounds great. Um, let me tell you a little bit about how we do that, and then some of the difficulty there is too. So. Um, every molecule out in our world has a very unique way of fingerprint of how it absorbs light. So you can actually use very specific wavelengths of light to learn about certain molecules. So the measurement we make relies on sunlight that comes down to the earth and then passes through the atmosphere again back up to the satellite. So the sun's moving through the atmosphere and interacting with these molecules. And we have three wavelength groups that we measure the first one shown here in blue is, is like a wavelength that your eye sees. It's called the oxygen band. And where this is black, it means the molecules absorbed all the light. Where it's white, they didn't absorb much light. And then you can see these kind of banded patterns that are very typical of molecular absorption. So the oxygen band, the one that's like your eye's wavelength, is very sensitive to clouds. If you try to look through a cloud, you really can't see that far because of the light absorption. The same is true of the light that we're looking at. The other bands we use are sensitive to carbon dioxide. So this banded pattern is the hallmark of carbon dioxide absorption. So by measuring this very sensitively, we can see when the amount of carbon dioxide changes because the light pattern will change. So that's the basic idea is look at sunlight that's reflected off of Earth, look at details of how the gases absorb light, and then we can measure the carbon dioxide. And we have to have um, pretty sophisticated atmospheric models to, or models of the light processes to do that. And that's what our teams are focused on. Uh, in addition, you want to make sure your data can be compared to other data, like that Mauna Loa Hawaii data I showed you. So we have a validation program where we use other techniques to connect our data to the other data sets. The, the one thing that's a challenge here is I told you our concentrations right now are about 400 parts per million. To learn about things, we actually need better than one part per million. So you think of that one out of 400, it's a very, very precise measurement. And that can be tricky to do from space, but we've actually made a lot of progress. So that's a little bit about how we're going to do this with our instrument in space. And now I just want to take a few minutes to show you some of the data we've collected, what it kind of looked like, patterns we see, uh, and then I'll get to some science results. So this is a map of data. I'm gonna show kind of a month at a time of our data. We've uh, blown up the footprint so you actually can see that pretty well on the globe and then just overlaid a month of measurements. So this is in September, 2015. Uh, through mid-October, and you see things are kind of blue and green, meaning you have concentrations here about 395 to 400. And they, they don't change that much from the south to the north, just a little bit. If we look one month later, uh, it's a little more uniform across the globe. And then finally here in uh, October, it's pretty much the same concentration across the globe. There's not enough sunlight to see in northern Canada and Eurasia, but we do see a lot in the southern hemisphere. Uh, so that's a November. And then when you get into December, things are looking a little bit more green or higher concentration up here in the north. And what's happened is you and I are still driving our cars and heating our homes, uh, as is the rest of the world, but the plants in the northern hemisphere aren't doing anything. They're not taking carbon dioxide out. So you see the concentration growing, and that's even more clear here in January and then into February. So we see a buildup in the Northern Hemisphere because humans are releasing carbon dioxide and no plants are countering that. As we move over into the spring, this is March, April, May. Now you see a little hint that the colors are turning blue and here they really get blue. So by June, the plants are really turned on in the Northern Hemisphere. They're taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, reducing the concentrations. It's like a big bite has been taken out. So the plants are really a strong player in this uh, carbon dioxide puzzle and very seasonal in the behavior. So here's July into August and then back to uh, August. 
Again, plants still taking it out in September, starting to be less dramatic in that feature. So that's the, this is actual data we've measured from our satellite in space, sampling the whole globe and seeing this big picture out over the oceans as well as the land. So a really new view of carbon dioxide. Uh, you saw the seasonality, the way the plants play a role. And then the other thing to just notice is this is September 2016. We're kind of in the blues and greens. And if you remember one year prior, you were much bluer. So that's a clear picture of how much carbon dioxide increases from year to year. That two to three part per million increase from one year to the next because of the excess emissions. Uh, so we really can get that view from space. It's um, it's been amazing to see this work so well and to see the kind of uh, view of the world we can gather. So that's the Orbiting Carbon Absor Observatory 2, OCO2, that's flying around, uh, repeats its patterns over the Earth. And we've had the opportunity to uh, actually provide one other piece of information I wanted to mention. Um, so the carbon dioxide is important, but it turns out that there's some light that plants are emitting when they do photosynthesis that we can actually see. So plants emit light during the photosynthetic process, and it's in a wavelength we're observing, so you can see that in the satellite data. And since 2010, a group of people have been working on extracting that and making sense of it. So this is just a map that shows you what was observed over a few months and not surprisingly the tropics where there's tons of really productive plants have a lot of this indicator of photosynthesis. In North America, the East Coast is much greener and more densely vegetated than the West half and you see that. Uh, and then India, China are very productive areas and so that shows up. So I'll, here and there I might mention, mention SIF or this solar induced fluorescence and that's what I'm talking about. So in 2019, we did something really exciting. This is a picture of the International Space Station. And I don't know if we have any space nerds in the house, but this is an amazing place. The whole thing with these solar panels and stuff, this is almost the size of a football field and it's flying around in space around you. So just amazing what they've done. And we managed to uh, build a payload. This is showing this one little part of the IS, the International Space Station here in the front that the Japanese are in charge of. And there's little places here you can plug in a payload and make a measurement. So they have uh, room for 10 of us on there to measure off of the Japanese exposed model, GEMI-F. And we went up there in 2019 uh, to add to our experiment and build OCO3. The heart of it's the same as OCO2, it's just packaged in a different way to go on the space station. Um, and for nerds like me, this was super exciting. We worked with SpaceX to get this launched up there. So this is showing that when we're on the ground, the SpaceX capsule, uh, you can look in, into it here and you see this is our payload on the upper left. Uh, it's attached to these beams and it's going to hang in there until it gets up to the space station. So they take this uh, capsule, stick it on top of the rocket and poof, off you go up into space. This was in May uh, 2019. And this lower right is one of my favorite pictures. This is that same capsule that I showed you on the ground, been released from the rocket. So now it's just flying through space. You see the Earth limb over here, and there's our little OCO3 payload. Um, SpaceX has a ton of cameras on everything they do. I'm sure you've watched the launch and seen some of the cool imagery. Uh, so it's really fun when you're doing science with them because you have a lot of great pictures uh, of your payload and, and the work you're doing. And then once you get up to the space station on that Dragon capsule, there's actually uh, the astronauts aren't doing the work. This is all done robotically. So there's an arm that comes out and grabs the Dragon capsule to capture it. Uh, and then once that's captured and docked, then the arm goes and grabs our payloads. So you see it attaching here on this end. It's going to take it out of the capsule and then actually hand off to a different arm that holds it on this other spot. And then that arm plugs you into the space station and this interface is where your power, data, cooling fluid are all uh, interfaced to your payload. So uh, this was super cool to watch all that robotic action happen.
And one of the cool things about this payload is it has a special pointing system. So this is a system that moves in two uh, ways and we can use that to point at special areas we want to view. So just a couple of stills to show you how it can rotate around to the side uh, and then point off. And we do this to capture something we call snapshot area map. So rather than just a line of data everywhere, uh, we use that pointing system and we build up first one stripe of data, then another, a third, a fourth, and a fifth, and you end up with about 50 miles by 50 miles being sampled with one mile by one mile little footprints of data. So a new way to kind of map out carbon dioxide that we had never done before. And these are um, interleaved with the routine measurements. So this is just showing you how we'll like make regular measurements over the ocean and then do some special mapping over the continent. Uh, some continents are more just routine mapping and then some special mapping, special modes. So we mix those modes in a very flexible way uh, to gather all the data. And here's just a couple of examples. So when we made that kind of mapping measurement over Buenos Aires, we did this a couple of times in September uh, 2019. And one thing I just wanted to point out here is the, the big city of Buenos Aires is here just off the water. And you see in one day, it was to the Northwest that you saw extra carbon dioxide, the more yellow color. Uh, and another day it was more to the Southeast. And this is just, changing winds. You'll have the cities always putting carbon dioxide out, but if the wind's pushing in one direction versus the other, you can see how the extra or enhancement of just a couple of parts per million uh, is observed in different areas. And we even did that here close to home. So this is the LA Basin, Mojave Desert up here, and you can see different patterns of the enhancement of the carbon dioxide depending on the winds and, and what else is going on. So this is a new view from cities of cities to actually see details like this uh, was brand new for OCO3. So we have a lot of exciting data collecting going on, uh, but you might be asking yourself, well, well, what have we actually learned? Did you answer those questions you asked? Have you figured out uh, how the carbon cycle is gonna change in the future? So let me just leave you with a few tidbits of what it was that we've discovered so far with all of these measurements from space. So I talked about how El Nino can, is a big climate driver. And remember in 2015, 2016, we had a big El Nino. And for the carbon community, it was actually quite exciting because what we saw was that a lot of carbon dioxide was left in the atmosphere much more compared to the years before. So we saw almost one gigaton per carbon extra from South America, from Africa, and from uh, Indonesia region. And remember, we, we released 10, and here there's almost one per continent extra that didn't get taken out. So it was a big, big change in the carbon uptake by the plants. But what was even more exciting is that we learned more about why that happened. So what we saw here was that South America had the driest year in almost 30 years during that El Nino. So those plants couldn't do the photosynthesis. You didn't see the SIF. They weren't taking carbon out. And that's why there was extra carbon over South America. It actually happened for a different reason over Africa. Africa was really, really hot. So the plants could produce leaves, but they de decompose really quickly. So that's why there was more carbon dioxide over this continent. And then Indonesia and this region was just on fire. So it was the really dry year there and fires broke out and so you had more carbon dioxide released. So this A lets us show different mechanisms at play in different continents, which we never had insight into before, but it also suggests that if climate becomes hotter and drier, these plants aren't gonna take out so much carbon dioxide and we're gonna see this growth rate be even more than it is. So that's, that's kind of the bad news of seeing what happened in this El Nino. Hotter and drier is not good for plants removal of carbon dioxide. Um, and Africa is an important role player, but if you can remember that map I showed you of the ground-based observations, we really didn't have much insight there with ground-based. Ground-based was mostly in Europe and North America. 
uh, didn't know much about Africa. So now the carbon folks are studying that in more detail and learning. It looks like it's been a source of carbon uh, for the last four years while we were observing it. So that's a new insight for us into what Africa is doing. And we do some research here close to home. So remember 2019 had big floods in the Midwest and people were interested, what did that mean for the crops? Uh, what did that mean for carbon cycle? Uh, and so basically the, the uh, floods meant that they couldn't plant the crops as early as they usually do. And then we looked at the SIF, this, this hint about what photosynthesis is happening, and you could see there was much less photosynthesis in 2019 compared to 2018, almost 15% less. Uh, and basically, the, you don't have to look at the details over here, but you could see uh, all the extra water in 2019. You could see that the plants weren't as active, and you could see there was more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So we thought this was amazing that with our satellites up in the sky, you can see even on a regional basis what's happening in the Midwest and how the floods impacted the plants and therefore the carbon cycle. So we're, we're starting to learn a lot and you use many different sources of information to learn about carbon cycle. We have some other folks that are focused on uh, more of the human piece of it. So this is a nice piece of work from a colleague in Europe. And he's showing here, this is OCO2 data in these colors where it goes from green, a red hot spot, and then green, showing that in a line plot here. And you see this bump of carbon dioxide. And that's basically a power plant located here. And it's emitting, and we cross the plume. Uh, this scientist used another pollutant measurement called nitrogen dioxide and, and also sees the plume in that data. So kind of helping confirm that you see just one or two part per million extra in a plume from a power plant. And some scientists are actually trying to now quantify power plant emissions based on these space-based measurements of the carbon dioxide. You can think of cities in the same way. A big city then creates a plume of carbon dioxide that blows downwind. So this is Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, and the purple is the model telling you what you think the plume of the city's emissions should be doing. And then there's a stripe of our actual data over top. Again, showing you see this bump up of a couple parts per million that's due to all these emissions flowing downstream. So further proof that space-based data can inform you about CO2 emissions, even at the level of a city's outflow. And those scientists took it even further. I thought this was pretty interesting. They said, how much CO2 is being emitted per person in these cities based on those measurements? And then they have other data about how many people live per square kilometer. And it's showing you if you have really dense cities like Dhaka, Seoul, and Mexico City, the, the per person emissions are lower than these less dense cities like Adelaide in Australia uh, or Las Vegas. And that kind of makes sense because we have to drive farther distances. We have houses instead of apartment blocks. And there's all sorts of things that become less efficient with your lower population density. Uh, but again, pretty cool they can see it from space. So I'm going to wrap up now, but hopefully I've convinced you that we can actually see carbon dioxide from space. Uh, there's interesting questions in the carbon cycle. What we've learned to date suggests that as things are warmer and drier, the plants aren't going to be so effective in removing carbon dioxide, uh, so the growth rate may actually speed up. And you know, my view of the world is that we've got to really stay focused on reducing CO2 emissions eventually getting to none. Uh, things like increased efficiency, you've changed your light bulbs, appliances are better, my new AC system is more efficient. Those will reduce our power use. Transportation is a huge element of this, especially in the US. We need higher efficiency cars, maybe electric cars, build our communities so we can walk and bike rather than drive everywhere, and then eventually transform power production to, mud, to renewables uh, like Steve was already talking about, solar, wind, and others are going to be important. And how do we do that in a smart, effective, uh, efficient way? And then, you know, it's not just you and me making change, but we need our policies and communities 
technology development and the humans, everybody's got to be moving in the same direction uh, to, to tackle this carbon dioxide emission uh, problem. So thank you so much for listening. I'm glad I had the opportunity to talk with you today. And uh, I think we've got some time for questions. So thanks so much. Thank you, Anne-Marie. That was so um, understandable. <laughs> I mean, awesome. this, is such, this is such high level science. Um, I do hope uh, we might receive some questions, but a couple occurred to me. Uh, and because what you do is those measurements and then uh, comparing with um, or looking for causes for those numbers, those trends and everything, um, I assume that there's some <clears throat> reporting that goes out there. Uh, does it go to governments and academics? I mean, do they have to come to you or is there a, a system of disseminating this information to appropriate? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Lorraine. So our primary goals are to get this data into the hand of scientists who do that work. But then we also um, make sure we feed what we find to our NASA leadership. And then once in a while, someone might be asked to go talk to national leaders. We also, you know, we talk to your groups and many of my colleagues will talk to community groups. So we try to uh, be effective in that interaction. And one of the other things we're trying to do is get tied to policymakers. Like how can the state of California benefit from the things we're learning? as they develop their science policy. So we're not like a huge piece of our work, but there is an element of our work to reach to the policymakers. Great, um, and we do have a question. Uh, Susie asks uh, two questions actually. Are you tracking the effects of California's mega fires? What kind of, uh, you know, have you seen from that? And then secondly, are we able to see the CO2 dynamics with your technology for the California desert region? Uh, and maybe do you know any particular um, uh, trends about that? Yeah, so the great questions. So the fires have been interesting. We've definitely taken a look at what we can learn about fires and there's sort of the good news, bad news. So the, the bad news is there's also a lot of smoke in fires so that can get in the way of our measurement. Um, and so we usually can't see anything right close to the fire. We have to wait till this, this plume goes downwind. And then the other thing is we need at least like this part per million enhancement. So the California fires were a little bit viewable. The Indonesian fires were very viewable because they were so massive. So I would call our fires medium massive, not hugely <laughs> massive so they were just at the edge of what we could see when you have a single fire we don't see it when you have a clusters we will pick up a little bit of info yeah and then the second question was about about any dynamics that uh your uh, data about the desert region in Southern yeah California. so we we I, I can't think of any specific researcher who's really focused on the desert, but certainly the like Africa is a very different landscape and they're trying to understand how it, it um, the role it plays. And I think because the, the um, release and uptake of the desert plants is actually much smaller than the release and uptake of say tropical jungles and, and these very humid, hugely green regions, it's a, it's a challenging kind of number to quantify. Um, so we don't, I don't think we have a really good view of that type of area. Um, probably some ground-based measurements are gonna be the best way to get more of a handle on what's happening there. And my, my, my thought would be the next generation of satellites might be able to help you, but ours is probably a little bit too insensitive to the small changes that you probably have in the desert regions. Well, one of the things that um, many of us who've been involved in, in this conservation work in the desert have learned is that there's a great deal of carbon sequestration in the desert soils, uh, you know, a whole different world from a jungle, but um, there is a lot that is already sequestered and uh, the uh, uprooting of it because of power plant, um, solar power and so forth is, uh, you know, not in favor. Uh, we have another uh, question that has come in. Um, concerning your equipment on the space station. How long has it been up there and how does the maintenance or service get done? Yeah, it's a, okay, so the I didn't mention that we got up there in May, 2019 
And we made a deal to have three years of data collection from the space station. So there's growing interest in using the space station for science. So other, other people want to do experiments. So we have limits to our time. So we're about halfway through our three years. Um, and one of the tricks of being a rocket scientist is you have to build stuff that doesn't need maintenance. So like our satellite that's been flying for six years, nobody's ever done anything to it. Same thing with OCO3, we had to have a plan that did not rely on any intervention, astronauts or anybody. So you build systems that um, can just keep running, but it's a little bit, I mean, there's not that many moving parts. That pointing mechanism is one thing that moves um, and that's the main piece. And if you're in space, right, you don't have dirt, you don't have junk, you've got temperatures that change a lot, but if you engineer it right, it's pretty plausible to keep it running for years without any updates or lubrication or anything like that. Um, what about the, how is the instrument cooled is another question. Yeah, so the space station is actually really nice in that way because there's ba basically kind of a big um, cooling system. There's a liquid fluid that runs through pipes on the space station and it cools our instrument and, and it sort of takes the heat out of our instrument and then it goes, brings it to another part of the space station and dissipates the heat. So we have a fluid that flies, comes through, which is really, really easy and steady. The other instrument has to have a radiator and insulation and just be built in a way that keeps it at kind of a steady temperature. Um, but we have, so yeah, there's engineers whose whole job is to take a look at the temperatures and the power and everything, watch it, keep it the way it should be. And I imagine the technology continues to advance on those kind of things. Um, yeah, it does. The downside is, is you want to make sure it's going to be safe in space. So my phone has like so much more power in its brain than my satellite does because <laughs> we, we end up using actually fairly old technology because it's been proven to not fry in the space environment. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, also, uh, a question, um, and thanks to Mike for one of those prior questions, and Steve too. Uh, and Steve asks, uh, how do you decide on those spot check areas? What are um, uh, when the satellite does a spot? Yeah, check? so I think I um, my answer might not be as interesting as you would like, but basically, myself and a few of my team members have uh, solicited input from our community of users and looked at some statistics like growth rates of cities, number of people in cities, um, and things like that. And we assembled a list of a uh, few hundred spots. And then once in a while, we'll get a phone call. Like the other day, someone said, hey, I'm going to put equipment out uh, here near Rotterdam. Can you try to make a measurement with your satellite in combination with me? So we work with partners who are out on the ground with special ground equipment and try to coordinate. It's pretty flexible, actually. Um, I'm curious, do you have interaction with like graduate students at Caltech and stuff like that? Do they, you have like interns and things like that? Yeah, no, we, we, um, we, my team mostly prepares the data and then we talk to the scientists who are doing the research. And so we have like faculty at Caltech who have postdocs that are all working on the data or faculty at University of Michigan and other institutes. We'll have some summer students, and even this year, we're going to try to bring students in remotely, and we'll probably have them do some programming work or some other data analysis that they can do from home. So we do, we really do try to have some interaction with the students, and the postdocs are critical to doing science with the data. Yeah. That's great. That's our future. Yeah. Um, how are the ocean, um, are the oceans reaching capacity in absorption of CO2, and if they are, what then? Yeah, uh, I'll answer part of that, but not all of that. So we do, um, we do, when the oceans in their normal way of exchanging carbon dioxide, it's not like such a massive sink like you saw with those plants. But we did see when El Nino happened, you know, it changes sea surface temperatures and winds. And we actually could see the change in the ocean uptake due to that El Nino effect. Um, I think that the current thinking is that the warming and the acidification is slowly slowing down the ocean capacity for uptake. 
So it's another one of the bad news pieces that as climate changes, they'll be less useful in removing our extra emissions. So that's you know, another driver why it's gonna be so important to reduce emissions because the plants and the oceans as they get warmer aren't gonna take out as much as they used to. Right. So yeah. Yeah, we have to stop putting it up there. Um, what about your team? Uh, are they all in one location? Or you mentioned you have colleagues in different places all over the world, but is there a main team right there at JPL? Yeah, we actually have kind of three legs to our three, our team, main team, our JPL colleagues. We have uh, about a half a dozen folks trained in atmospheric science and math and engineering that are doing this work. Caltech's a really important partner, so they lead a lot of the validation effort. And then Colorado State actually has a great atmospheric sciences department and they're a key member. So when the pandemic hit and we all had to start working from home, uh, it took a little bit of adjustment, but we've actually were quite used to working with people in different locations and doing phone meetings all the time. So, uh, and as I mentioned, you don't have hands on your spacecraft for the guys who drive the spacecraft. If you drive it from your office at home or you drive it from work, it doesn't really matter. So it was a pretty smooth and efficient transition to remote working and the dispersed teams um, are part of that element that we're used to working across different areas. Great, so no drop in productivity. <laughs> Not too much. Yeah. Um, are there any plans for updated instruments to be placed on the space station, uh, especially regarding air pollution? Wow, it's almost like I fed questions to this group. Uh, that's a great <laughs> one. <laughs> so the, the, um, the air pollution Direction in satellites is actually less on the space station because this, oh, I didn't mention this. Space station has a funny little orbit, and you see some from about 52 north, or you see from Rotterdam down to the south of Australia. You don't see the highest northern lands, like Canada is not that viewable, the very south. So it's a weird little orbit. And what people in the air quality community want now is they want to see air pollutants evolving over the day. So there's a move to try to go to geostationary satellites. So you probably all know about our weather satellites that really just see one piece of the world all day long. So we're trying to do that with air pollution. So there's an instrument that's been built that's going to go up a geostationary over the Americas. The Koreans already put one up over Asia and the Europeans are getting ready for one over uh, Europe. So that's the new direction for air quality is geostationary. Think of uh, pollution weather is the new, new direction. For mm -hmm. carbon dioxide, the Europeans are planning to invest over a billion euros and go from what we are doing with that six mile wide swath of data to hundreds of mile wide swaths of data. So they want to see the whole world every day for carbon um, and it's sort of, we put up a few instruments and demonstrated it, it works. And now the Europeans are gonna take the next step and go to these full mapping instruments around 2025, which in my world is soon. Huh. Wow. Another question, uh, we've heard that the environment has healed some with the pandemic. Uh, has it lessened carbon emissions as your instruments are measuring it? Yeah, so I was part of a team that we did study this in some detail to figure out its pandemic effects. And I think the, the um, you saw dramatic changes in the short term, air pollution especially, as people stopped driving and industry slowed down. Uh, carbon reduction was a little bit less. You sort of think maybe 10% less this year than last year. So it's like rolling back emissions a couple of years. Uh, but it's, I don't think it's going to be sustained, right? This is kind of a blip. And then the worry is we, two things. One, we go back to our normal behaviors and start flying around the world and driving everywhere. And, um, you know, then this hasn't changed our systems, right? We need to change transportation. We need to change power generation. Pandemic just kind of paused people's behaviors, but it didn't really address the root cause. Thank you. Um, is there a dedicated astronaut on the space station that is responsible for the OCO3? Yeah, there is not, but we made friends with the astronauts. Actually, we um, took the opportunity when we were getting ready to launch to find out who was going to be up there and reached out to them. So 
Christine, I'm not going to remember her name. There's a woman who came home last year, but she was one of our contacts and we would talk to her and she took some special pictures from inside the cupola on the space station. Um, so they're, they actually keep really busy with hands-on experiments. There's a bunch of things that get sent up that they have to manipulate. And we're just kind of window dressing, plugged in on the outside. But uh, we did have a little contact with the, the early on with the astronauts up there. Well, um, we've run out of questions. Uh, I, a lot of good ones. Thank you to Steve and Mike and Susie and Columba, all asked questions. Um, we'll give you, a, I don't see anybody typing in anything as a last minute uh, thought. So I'm going to turn it over to Steve for closure. Oh, uh, Sarah's pointing to someone, but oh, Sarah, let me uh, unmute her. Sorry, uh, Arch has a question. Oh. I'm seeing him moving. Oh, okay. We'll get him unmuted. Oh, hi. Yeah, my question was, do the non-ISS satellites have provide coverage of the full surface of the Earth? Are they in a polar orbit or something? And, and so you don't have the limitation on latitude. Yeah, so that's a good question, Art. So they are in a polar orbit. And um, because we need sunlight and the sun cannot be too low in the sky, there's, oh, we have a, I'm not even remember the number, but there's a latitude band we measure and it kind of slides up and down north and south as the seasons slide. So we don't quite see over the poles and even like Northern Canada will only be sampled for half of the year. So there are some limits and, and that's unfortunate because places like Alaska are actually really interesting. Like, What's going to happen to the permafrost, or how are those trees playing their role? And we get some information on that, and then there's actually some big field campaigns to fly airplanes around those areas because uh, the airplanes can sample them too. So you, you always need a few approaches to get to the most interesting places, it seems. Well, thank you again. I uh, felt like your presentation was so understandable and your questions equally so so. really glad glad to have the opportunity to share with people who really care so thank you steve take it thank away thank you so much Anne marie so following up on this uh the fact that certain portions of the planet you are not able to measure carbon dioxide from space so you use other other methods uh, like balloons or aircraft or something i gather to measure is all of the data then uh, ending up being combined into one location that shows uh, shows the carbon dioxide uh, uh, on the overall planet, and, and wh where is that data uh, housed? Yeah, so all like all the data that gets collected, like ours in the airplane and so on, anyone can download it from data centers that NASA runs, and then. I showed you that model picture early in my presentation and the way that we use our data actually is people run models like that, but incorporate the measurement data and then where their model didn't look like the measurement, they adjust a bit. So they basically try to adjust the models to look like all the data that we have and including the ground-based data, the plane data and the satellite data. So that's a whole field of work to make use of this data and learn about all these processes. And that's been going a little slower than we thought it would have. We thought we would have been able to tell you tons of things by now, but just the math to do that's a bit complicated. Uh, so it's still quite active bit of work to make use of that data. Well, fascinating pre presentation. Thank you so much. How did, how is it that you became interested in in doing this? What was it? Was there a, a, a something in particular that really said this is something I would really like to pursue? Yeah, I mean, I think there were sort of two or three decision points that brought me here. And one was when I was an undergraduate student as a chemical engineer, your summer jobs led me to believe I would either like work at a work in some sort of a refinery or work as a chemical engineer making soap or food products. It, 
didn't seem super, super interesting. And then I took a final class in my senior year on air pollution engineering. I was like, this is cool. It's practical. It solves problems and it's good engineering. And then that's why I came out to LA to study the smog. And when you study the smog in LA, then you start thinking, well, it's not just here, it's many places. And that's when I started realizing that something like a satellite is a great way to understand the big, big picture. So kind of all those ingredients, because I do care about the environment, but I like hard technical problems. That's how I ended up moving to JPL to do air pollution and climate glasses from space. So it's been kind of a fun journey, yeah. Well, you've certainly stepped into a hard technical problem with this one. Boy, this is <laughs> about um, as big a problem as we've got. And Pat, thank you. Pat, Pat had a question, I think. Yeah, I have a little question. This, your uh, PowerPoint was absolutely brilliant. And I'm, I, I believe this has been um, captured so people can come back and look at the presentation. But I'm wondering if the PowerPoint by itself is also could be available through us so it could be used by classrooms. And um, because it just says a lot and in a beautifully clear way. And Pat, thank you so much for that positive feedback. And yeah, I think one thing I'll do though is put a few more notes into the notes section and then I'll work with Steve and Lorraine to get them that PowerPoint and it can be used as you guys would like. And if you thank have you. contacts in education, Give a call. I'm happy to talk to classrooms and other groups. Thank you. I will. Well, Anne Marie, thank you so very much for, for being here today and talking about this, uh, this pesky gas that uh, we're having to deal with. It's uh, obviously is the it, it's the driver with so many decisions that have to be made now. And your your insight. Uh, is, is critical to our getting a handle on this thing. So thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Just uh, really, really wonderful. Thanks, thanks so very much. My pleasure, thanks for having me y'all. And uh, with that, uh, I, will, uh, I will adjourn our annual meeting and uh, thank, thank you all for being here. Uh, uh, Michael Madrigal, thank you so much for your for your, for your blessing to, to begin this, something really for us to, to, to chew upon as well as Anne Marie. So, so thank you very much. And uh, with that, uh, uh, until uh, please do go to our website uh, and, and Lorraine Turk is monitors and, and keeps our, she's our web uh, uh, monitors and administers our website. She posts a tremendous amount of really useful topical current information on the website and i encourage people to to uh, please go and visit it and you'll see uh, uh, so many issues and items that i think will find uh, interesting and and informative to us and go to our website please and uh, sign up for our e-blast and sign up to become a member as well and uh, with that i Look forward to seeing you at our annual at our annual meeting next year. But in the meantime, please come to attend our board meetings, which are, are now that we're doing them all virtually, it's much easier to do. So go to our website and request an invite, and we'll happy to let you in. So with that, goodbye. <laughs>